Good morning, church. I invite you to open your Bible to the book of Haggai, chapter 2. Last Sunday, a week ago, we started to study a little bit this chapter, not in depth, and we are going to read today the last bit of the chapter from verse 20 till the end of the chapter 2 in the book of Haggai. The word of the Lord came to Haggai a second time on the 24th day of the month. Tell Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, that I am going to shake the heavens and the earth. I will overturn royal thrones and shatter the power of the foreign kingdoms. I will overthrow chariots and their drivers, horses and their riders will fall, each by the sword of his brother. On that day, declares the Lord Almighty, I will take you, my servant Zerubbabel, son of Shaltiel, declares the Lord, and I will make you like my signet ring, for I have chosen you, declares the Lord Almighty. Amen. Father, as we are coming to study your word, I pray that today you will give us heavenly wisdom, insight, and guidance through your Holy Spirit, so we fully grasp what you intend for us to understand and then to apply in our lives. We humble before you and we acknowledge that without your assistance we can do nothing, without you in life we can do nothing. So we just humble and ask that through your Holy Spirit, you will make this word alive to us. We know that in itself there is life and mighty power, a power to transform our lives. That's why we pray that you will open our minds, open our spiritual eyes, and open our heart to accept your word and make it work in us and model us the likeness of your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Dear church, as I said last Sunday, we already start digging in this chapter. I aim to have a shorter sermon. It didn't happen. It was quite lengthy, actually. And we start issuing, looking at this issue of discouragement and uh, dealing with discouragement in our daily life, but especially in ministry. And as we are going through these very difficult times, unprecedented times in history and church like never before has been shut and unable to meet physically in one place for so many months throughout the world. Now there is a kind of freedom to get back but with so many limitations, regulations, things to apply, things to consider and therefore we haven't been yet able to return in this place, in what we used to enjoy life together. And um, throughout the world, I've been in touch with various pastors and uh, leaders, church leaders that I know. Many of them are not yet able to serve their churches as they used to. They cannot gather in some parts of the world. They can gather only outside, in other parts. Uh, they start returning to church in large capacities only to discover that in a few weeks' time they've got some limitations and uh, they are not allowed more than 10, for instance, in Austria. And uh, here in England, things are also very different. Some churches are back, some not. And actually, this Sunday we are going to discuss, after our Zoom service, uh, what's the best way going forward. And as I said last Sunday, I want to reinforce, yes, we may get discouraged. I've been battling through discouragement uh, over the years in ministry and recent months as well, considering our present situation. So God brought a lot of encouragement in my life through this specific book of Haggai. I've chosen not to study it in depth just because I want to 
specifically address this issue of discouragement. Just a quick recap. We've learned last Sunday that Haggai came with a series of four short messages, kind of short sermons to God's people on his time. First, he addressed their priorities in chapter 1. We've learned how the people had this amazing opportunity after they returned from the exile, after years of being captives under Babylonians, and they've got these amazing opportunities to rebuild the temple. They've started doing so until a point when they thought it's not the right time. That's what they thought, it's not the right time. For a series of reasons, which I'm not aiming to discuss today. Therefore, if it wasn't the right time to focus on God's temple, they thought it's the right time to focus on themselves, on their own houses, on their own prosperities. Yes, because of a crisis in their own country, uh, things went wrong, they had inflation, they, their economy wasn't great, so they had to secure a living, as we would say. And God had to bring a message of rebuke, of challenging in their lives, to reorganize their priorities. And through this short sermon in chapter 1, Haggai actually comes to them and with this word from God challenges their priorities, explaining that actually they are facing this crisis because they've neglected God's house. And that's why they couldn't actually save money, they struggled with all kinds of issues, economical issues, because they were too focused on themselves and they had to put God first. Then he comes and he somehow revived the spirit of this governor called Zerubbabel and uh, the high priest Joshua and uh, challenged them to mobilize the people and rebuild the temple. Chapter 2 starts with this new beginning, when God's people, with great enthusiasm, are about to rebuild the temple. They start laying the foundation, and they've been working 21 days until they suddenly had to face this big issue of discouragement. We've learned why. I'm not going to repeat the sermon, but the main reason was because they start, those who had lived enough, those elderly people who had lived enough to remember the old temple, now they start looking at this new construction and this, in their sight was nothing like it used to be. Worthless! And they brought so much discouragement that people had to abandon, abandon the work. And through this second sermon of Haggai, God brought encouragement saying that actually, even if in their own sight, this seems worthless because nothing compares with the good old days. In God's sight, things are entirely different and He has a new plan for them. And He is going to make this temple even greater, the glory of this temple, greater than the former one. And we've learned why, because in this very temple, Jesus Christ himself, after years, will step in and fill the temple with his presence, with his glory. Then there is a third message in the middle section of chapter 2. And this is going to address a specific issue, which I'm not going to address it today. In a sense, it is related with a previous sermon, actually in two parts, I've had about a month ago. This had to do with the way we do ministry. They come back to work, they were ministering, if you like, they were serving God, they were building the temple, but they mixed clean and unclean stuff, their lives, some of their lives were not completely holy. They didn't have pure motives. God had to challenge this too, again. 
is God did fulfill his promises to them that he's going to bless them he he had to hold these promises they couldn't be fulfilled because of the lack of holiness in their lives in a sense this ties in with the message i had from first corinthians chapter 3 when we can build in god's kingdom but with hay and straws and wood flammable materials but at that final day will burn out will burn now we arrive to the fourth message this fourth message that we've just read from verses 20 is a very personal message addressed to the leader of the country to Zerubbabel Zerubbabel how you may say in English I struggle with this name now, the same message is linked with other things God already had mentioned to um, the entire people, and we will make some connections later on. This fourth message has been delivered in the same day with the third message, perhaps later in the evening, we don't know exactly, but in the same day. Perhaps that was just a private talk in between the prophet Haggai, or Haggai and Zerubbabel. A personal message to a leader that grew discouraged as well. But his motive of discouragement was a little bit different. The reason of his discouragement was based on something else, perhaps. And we will learn about this. Well, the people earlier on had been discouraged because they compared the old with the new, or the old temple, the former temple, with their new construction building. And they were so discouraged because of this, and God had to bring encouragement. Now, Zerubbabel struggled with a few other things. And before we get to the heart of this short text, we need to look a little bit at the context. Who is this person, Zerubbabel? And why is he called here the governor, not the king? Well, he comes from a noble line of kings. He follows in the throne line. Of the kings of Judah. In his veins flows royal blood. He is the nephew of a king, the last king of Judah before they were taken captives in Babylon. Who is this king? If you turn with me in Jeremiah chapter 24, sorry, 22, verse 24, we will discover who is Zerubbabel's grandfather. And here we have another prophet, Jeremiah, a well-known prophet, who came with a message to this king called Jehoiakim. Let's read verse 24 and 25. As surely as I live, declares the Lord, even if you, Jehoiakim, son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, here wear a signed ring, wear a signed ring on my ring hand, right hand, I will still pull you off. I will deliver you into the hands of those who want to kill you, those you fear. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and the Babylonians. Now, I don't want to take too much time with this, but this is not a good king. This is a king who had done wrong in God's sight. Now, God brings a word of judgment, and he says, even if you may, may try to turn from your, your, your evil things, 
it's too late. Now, once you were a signed ring on my right hand, I will let them pull you off and take you in captivity. Zerubbabel is his nephew. So in his life, there might be a few issues to address. He may struggle with several things. One, he may be hunted by the past. The curse that came over his grandfather may follow him. He remembers what grandfather has experienced and he fears about his life, his present and his future. But on the other hand, once they return to the country from captivity, now they've been here over 16 years, in their own land, and he comes from a royal family with royal blood in his vein. Once he sees these opportunities from the very first days, he desires what he thinks he should receive and enjoy the kingship. He has a desire for a position as a king and on the throne he longs of course for significance and control. Everyone that aspires to such a position desires control. Actually in life we need to acknowledge each single one of us desire control. We want to be in control on our, on our own lives. We have spoken so many times about this very issue in our lives, in this building, through our church. And this is something that God, over and over again, has to challenge in our lives. Because we need to understand that He is in control of all things. Yes, he is giving us a specific context and times when we have our own perimeters or zone where we can obviously exercise our authority in our positions. So Zerubbabel or Zerubbabel, I'm pretty sure, aspire for this position as a king. And he was looking for these privileges, controlling significance. But 16 years had passed. They have freedom, but they don't have freedom. They are in their land, but he, he is not really the king, he is just the governor, because this is exactly what the Persians used to do. They gave them freedom to a certain extent. They allowed them to rebuild the temple. They even gave them through Sirius uh, some resources. These resources of fundings have been stopped with Darius, the other king of Persia. However, when they gave people the rights to come back to their own countries, they were still in control. So no one else could be the king. So they had to give another position, a lower position, governors who had to obey the empire, the real king, as they thought. So for over 16 years, this man, this leader, who is called by God to do a great thing, he looks at his life and he sees himself as a failure. Yes, as a failure. He has not the control that he wants. He has not fulfilled the mission that God assigned to assist and rebuild the temple. He wastes so long, there's so much time. Perhaps every single day when he looks outside, he sees all these Persian soldiers with their chariots and horses riding around. 
see over and over again, he thinks, I'm just a puppy. Yeah, I'm just a puppet. A puppet that someone else is manipulates. I'm used by them. I'm not in control. What can I do? And let's pause here. We may think the same, especially those who are in the leadership of the church, now complying with all these regulations and thinking what's going to be? Is this something organized from high above? Is this something that they want to you know, manipulate God, the people and the whole world and is this going to lead to the end times and all kinds of questions. And we want to be in control. But God has to come to us in the same way as he came to Zerubbabel with a very simple message to bring encouragement and to help us not to lose sight of at least three things. And as we go back to our text, this is how God brings encouragement, or if you like, helps Zerubbabel to overcome discouragement by addressing his very issue his desire of control and that led him into discouragement. Inviting him to consider three things or to look at three things. Basically God points towards three things in this short text. Let's name them all and then I will rephrase them in a specific way for us in, a, in order to be applicable to us today. First, God points to himself. While Zerubbabel struggled with himself, with, with his own uh, past, with his own present, with his fear about the future, God points to himself, to God himself, inviting Zerubbabel to consider what he, what God can do, not what he, Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel can do. We will notice this very vividly. Then, the second thing, God points to the future, not to the present, and neither to the past. In other words, he is inviting Zerubbabel to see or to consider the future that God is preparing, not the present, and even worse, the past, as we have learned last Sunday, trying to compare. And the third thing, God points to his own plans, not Zerubbabel's plans. In other words, he is inviting Zerubbabel and he is inviting you and me to consider what is our place in God's plan? Not to observe or try to make a space for God in our God in our plans. So three things. God points to himself as God, God points to the future, and God points to his plans. Let's dig into the first one. Six times in this short passage, we come across, or we read, this pronoun referring to God himself. From verse 21, Tell Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, that I am going to shake the heavens and the earth. Then verse 6, 22nd, I will overturn royal thrones. Then, second part of verse 22, I will overthrow chariots. Verse 23, middle part, I will take you, my servant Zerubbabel, son of Sheltiel. I will make you like my sin ring, for I have chosen you. Six times 
God points to himself. And in the context, I've identified at least seven other times in chapter 2. Make it to at least 13 times when God refers to himself and what he can do. If you read from verse, um, verse 5, this is what I covenant with you, he says. And I'll come back to this. Verse 6, I will once more shake the heavens. Verse 7, I will shake all nations. Verse uh, 7, the last part, I will fill the house with glory. Last part of verse 9, I will grant peace. Then as we move towards the end, verse 17, I, I struck all the work of your hands. Verse 18, uh, sorry, verse 19, the last part, from this day on, I will bless you. You see, how many times God refers to himself. When we desire control, we obviously place ourselves in the center. It's all about us. It's my aspirations. It's what I think I deserve. I look for significance and I look it in my own ways. God, over and over again, he has to bring me through various circumstances of my life or bring various challenges and sometimes messages like this just to bring our attention back to him. And he is inviting us, as he did it with Zerubbabel, to consider what God can do, not what we can do. But we know the theory. And it's so hard to apply it sometimes. When we face situations like this and we think we are hopeless, what can we do? What can I do as a pastor and an immigrant in this country? What can you do? What can we do to change? Oh, we can do things. Especially praying, being faithful to God. We can do lots of things. But all of this through God's power. At the end of all, He is in control. And He is doing something. And he's doing it with a purpose. We, we may not fully understand why. It may be exactly what had happened with these people of God, Israelites, Jewish people in that very context. As we read verse, uh, chapter 1 and even the middle section of chapter 2, God brought all sorts of calamities. God brought the crisis in their life as a nation. Why? Because of their disobedience because they failed to do what they were called to do. Oh yeah, sometimes we may uh, accuse God for things like that and we think, well, why, why? Well, he actually just had to respond to what we have done and we are the real cause of things. We don't know exactly why we are facing this issue. We don't know. We just know. God is in control. And this is exactly what God wanted Zerubbabel to understand. Although you think, I've given you these new great opportunities, and you look at yourself, you are just a governor, you can't do much, and you ask yourself every day, what can I do? I'm just a puppet. And they are manipulating me, they are using me. Zerubbabel, look at me. Look at me. I will do all these things. I will shake heaven and earth. I will shake nature. I will shake creation. I will shake history. I will shake everything. I will make all things new. Rest on this assurance. I am in control. I am a sovereign God. I am on the throne. And when I am on the throne, it doesn't matter what is exactly your position. I chose you, as we will see later on, and I have a specific plan with you. I want to work through you in this difficult time. Then God also reminded him 
earlier reminded the whole nation about his faithfulness. In verse 5, when the first thing we read, the first pronoun, God, I, this is what I covenant with you when I came, when you came out of Egypt, and my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. This is what I covenant. In other translations, this is what I promise to you. Rest on my promises. Do not fear. One time in this chapter, do not fear, and three times, be strong, be courageous, be strong. The same like he had to say to Joshua, not a high priest in this context, uh, but Joshua, the disciple of Moses, who had to take the leadership of God's people and bring them in the promised land. So, regardless of what we are facing right now, regardless of the whole uncertainty about the future. I'm thinking on what can we do? Rest assured on God's promises. Look at Him. This is what He is inviting us today. Don't look at you. Don't look at your leaders. Don't look at what we as people can do. Look at what God can do. What He had said to Zerubbabel, that specific context had a personal and immediate implication in his own context, in his own life, in the life of those people, but also some eschatological implications, of which I'm not going to discuss today. But it is a good portion, a good deal applicable to us today. It's the same old simple truth. Always and always again, look at him, look at what he can do, rest on his promise. Claim his promises over your life. The second uh, oh, observation, if you like, or uh, invitation to, to consider is to consider the future, not the present. In this last section of chapter 2, when God comes to speak to Zerubbabel through Haggai, most of the times, five times, God is referring to the future. I am going to shape the heavens and the earth. I will overturn royal thrones and shepherd. I will overthrow chariots and their drivers. Horses and their riders will fall, each by the sword of his brother. So, you see, I will, I will. Verse 23, on that day, declares the Lord Almighty, I will take you, my servant Zerubbabel, son of Shaphia, declares the Lord, and I will make you like my signet ring. In other words, he's inviting us to live our lives or live our present in the light of the future. Too often we are caught in the present or even worse in the past. The past is chasing us, is hunting us. Those issues, those failures, those sins of the past. Oh, I struggle with them too. Each one of us, we have things in our lives that we struggle to. And times to times, they are coming out of nowhere in our lives, in our minds to hunt over us. This is what the Lord wants us to forget, the former things. We can learn from the past. We can understand the future in the light of the past, learning what, had God, what God had done in our past and for what purpose He brought various things to shape our lives and prepare us for the future. But in that sense, it's fine, not always stuck in the past. And neither in the present, when we look and we see which other hopeless, as he had seen himself looking on those chariots and horses and soldiers, and he was always struggling with perhaps these questions, will I ever, will, will I ever be what I should be? Will I be able to do what I should do? Will I ever be in control? God is inviting him to look at the future. That's why 
we need as a church to look at the future. Some of us may never see with our own eyes, physical eyes, here on earth, what God is about to bring in the life of George Road Baptist Church, in the light of the vision he gave us, with the merging, with the new construction, and all kinds of beautiful things we had discussed. But neither Zerubbabel could see all these promises being fulfilled with his own eyes. Many of them had been fulfilled later in time, after he died. So it may be the case, but be assured that God is going to fulfill his promises. And he's going to do grand things in the future. Just as a matter of fact, it's interesting, as we move on towards the third thing to discover soon. Uh, in the future... God is going to bring this name, giving the honor that he may never dream to have. Right now, he is just a governor and he died as a governor, not as a king. But he broke his name, God broke his name, in the gene genealogy of Jesus Christ himself. A far superior And uh, for those of you who like to study in depth, I invite you to study today or in the week ahead the, 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 the both genealogies of Jesus. First one found in Matthew chapter 1 and the second one uh, in Luke chapter 3. In Matthew we can read the gene genealogy uh, based on uh, Joseph's life, the earthly father of Jesus. And in Luke is the gene genealogy of Mary, the early mother of Jesus. It's interesting, as you read through all those names, you'll find that on both lines, God allowed two special people to be there. One is King David, because God had a covenant with David. And David, is on both lines, from Joseph's lines and Mary's line. Then after David, things split and they return into one person called Zerubbabel. And this name, Zerubbabel, this governor who aspired to have a position, significance, to be in control as a king, he died without seeing the whole promise being fulfilled with his own eyes here on earth, but later he is in the line of Jesus on both sides, Joseph and Mary's. You'll find his name in Jesus' genealogy. That's quite special, I think, and would be worth studying it. That's why God is inviting us to look at the future, at what he's about to do, and at the end of all, to the grand finale, finale of this word, when he will return, Jesus Christ himself will come. When things will seem to be under the control of the evil ones, and Satan will be somehow playing with humanity like never before in those end times. We are approaching soon. Antichrist will seem to be in control. The whole terror will settle in the world that is described in the Bible. We look at the future and we know this is not the end. But suddenly, the king of all kings will return. He will overthrow all these evil powers, all those who brought terror in this world, and he will bring the peace, the, the eternal peace that we all aspire for. What an amazing day that will be, and I look
look forward to it. We, it might be in our generation. No matter what we are facing today, no matter what we are going through today, I look forward to that future because I know he will return and he will overthrow all these earthly, evil, demonic, sometimes powers. The third thing, he is inviting us all to examine or to um, notice or consider today is God's plan. He has a plan through all this. But he is inviting us to consider what is our place in God's plan. Not the other way, as we often tend to do. And what is the other way? We try to fit God in our own plans. Oh, we have fantastic plans. We, are, we have plans for our private lives, we have plans for our families, plans for churches, for work, for whatever. All kinds of plans and agendas. And so often that's the problem we face every day. We try to fit God in our plans. We try to offer God a place in our plans. And therefore we pray simple and sincere prayers like God help me to succeed here and there, God be with me here and there, God uh, do this, do that, and we have a to-do list for God. Because we try to, you know, create some space or a place in our plans for God. Nothing, nothing wrong to pray, you know, for God's help here and there. But that's not exactly what God wants. God wants fully understand and realize what is our place in his plans. He has a plan, a grand plan for each one of us. And we need to fit in his plans, not God fitting in our plans. And perhaps that was the issue of Zerubbabel as well. Well, God, I'm just a puppet. I'm not in control, I, you know, give me, give me power, give me strength, help me to overthrow all these powers, and, you know, restore the, the kingship and be back in the line of the kings of Judah. Help me in my plans, help me succeed. God, through all this message, I am doing, I will, I will, I will. He's just saying, you know, I have a plan. But when we come to the very last verse, I will make you like my signet ring. Signet ring. For I have chosen you, declares the Lord. I have chosen you. I, not you. Even you may struggle and you may think, oh, will I repeat the story? of my grandfather. You know, in Jeremiah, we just read in chapter 22, verse 24, that his grandfather, Jehoiakim, he was like a signet ring, a seal, on God's right hand, in a metaphoric way, saying, you are so precious for me. I've chosen you, and I used you as a signet ring on those days. That was a fantastic powerful thing. With that signet ring, which was quite a big fat ring, a king would seal uh, a letter, an object, uh, a valuable thing, and you would know, but that would prove his ownership. Whatever would have been sealed with that signet ring gives rights to the king. And we know that in there, there is authority, there is value, and everything. And God had to throw away that signet ring in a metaphoric way. His grandfather was rejected. Now, while he may have been hunted, Zerubbabel may have been hunted by the past, God brings in discussion the future, but also the present now, saying, look, I have plans for you. 
I've chosen you. And you are like a signet ring. A signet ring. That, that is Zorobabel. Zorobabel. That is what brings significance in your life. Not what you do. Not what you aspire to. No. But the fact that I have chosen. Your real significance comes from the fact that I chose you and I have plans for you. And when we come to our lives, this is exactly the same thing. Our real significance right now, wherever we are, comes not from what we do, not on, based on our studies or our pedigree or whatever you want. It comes based on the fact of who we are in Christ. We are chosen by Him, by God, to be part of His family. And He has plans for each one of us. He chose us for purpose. So my question for you is, how well do you know what is your part in God's plan for your life? How well do you understand what is your part in this church? In these times, when you think, I'm hopeless, what can I do? Well, you can do a lot of things. Not just consume, not act like an immature Christian or a baby Christian, as we've learned some time ago from 1 Corinthians chapter 3, thinking all, only all about themselves, what we can receive, what we can consume, but as a mature Christian, thinking what can we do, what can we fulfill in our ministry, in our special call for God. What is our part to play in His plan? If you don't know it yet, that's exactly what you are missing. And I invite you to pray today and to pray in the week to come. God, reveal to me what is your plan for me? What do you want me to do? How can I achieve it? Through you. Or you can use me as a tool to achieve all these things through me. God has a specific part for each one of us to play in his economy, in his church, in his kingdom. Not just for the pastors, for those who are leaders and so on. All those robable is a governor. He comes from a kingdom. But we are all part in his family. We are all a royal priesthood. So pray, fast, serve God's church. As only God's people can do. Because they have been chosen for a specific purpose. And with this in mind. I would like to conclude. And uh, in this conclusion, because Haggai finished here, it doesn't mean the life of Zerubbabel or Zerubbabel finishes here. Another prophet comes and he brings a few other messages. As we read through the next prophet, Zechariah, in chapter 4, we, 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 we find another message that God has for this man, Zerubbabel, that I think is applicable to us too. From verse 6, I just want to read this in conclusion of this sermon. Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6. So he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. And I will say, to George Road Baptist Church, to Emmaus, to those Christians who are listening to this sermon today. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. What are you mighty mountain before Zerubbabel? You will become level ground. Then he will bring out the capstan of shouts of God's blessed. God bless it. Then the word of the Lord came to me. The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this temple. His hands will also complete it. 
then you will know that the Lord Almighty has sent me to you. Who dare despise the day of small things? Since then, seven eyes of the Lord that range throughout the earth will rejoice when they see the chosen capstone in the hand of Zerubbabel. But this is another sermon in itself. But what a great reminder that whatever we are going to achieve in the future, it's not going to be by our, our strength, resources, abilities, not by my might, but by my power, but my, by spirit, says the Lord. This is happening when we will focus on God himself and what he can do, not us, on the future, not on the present circumstances, or even worse, the past. And when we will realize what is our place in God's plan, not trying to fit God in our plans, then he will work with mighty power through his, his spirit, through us, in the midst of us. And as we will return to church soon, what we say church to this building, to what we may expect as normal services, not Zoom services, I said this last Sunday, you will see it with your own eyes. It's going to be very, very different. <laughs> very different. My friends, don't grow weary or discouraged. Don't try to compare. Don't try to be in control. Accept this and be encouraged by verse 10. Who dares despite the day of small things? Who dares? We will become what no one had ever thought we were last year, for instance. We were expecting a larger cloud after the merging. We were expecting to grow in numbers. And in many ways, things have turned exactly the opposite way. Like a church plant, small numbers limitation of all kinds but who dares despite the day of small things says the lord i'm not daring to despise it i dare to trust in him and what he is about to do and i invite you to do so too amen